understand it closely. Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, thanks for joining my presentation today. Uh, I'd like to request uh, before we begin uh, that you defer questions until the end. I do have a lot of material to cover. Uh, if committee members have questions, of course, I will have to honor them. I know that we all have questions, so I'm prepared to abide <laughs> by that. But uh, so I, I should take about an hour or so, just about, and uh, help yourself oh, to some refreshments. <laughs> Last time you tried to do that, an hour or five minutes or so. Help yourself to some refreshments, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, so uh, this morning I'll talk about the context-driven subgraph model for literature-based discovery. And to motivate this talk, uh, I will examine two existing scientific discoveries to put into the historical perspective of science of what it means to do literature-based discovery. I could have chosen from any number of uh, existing scientific discoveries, but these two are appealing for reasons that I believe will soon become apparent. So, in 1866, Austrian scientists Gregor Johann Mendel did some seminal work on P hybridization. He conducted over 10,000 experiments in which he explored the research question of the characteristics of the inheritance of traits in peas across several generations in the lineage. What he observed was that the inheritance of traits in, in these plants, they seem to be influenced uh, beyond the, the immediate uh, Parents, the traits of the immediate parents uh, to several generations uh, ahead in the lineage. Um, he, he therefore was able to explain that the inheritance of traits in, in peas seemed to be influenced by what he called uh, dominant and recessive factors, which occurred in his, uh, according to his paradigm in pairs, which split during the pollination phase and then independently recombined. He eventually put forth what is now known as the Mendelian Laws of Inheritance. He theorized that uh, the law of, of segregation, which covers the splitting aspect of these dominant and recessive factors, and the law of independent assortment, which uh, speaks to the equal and independent likelihood that they would recombine uh, subsequently. Uh, this was interesting work. Uh, Johann Mendel is now credited as the founder of genetics. In 1903, uh, American, bio, American physician Walter Sutton conducted some seminal research of his own on, in which he observed the research question of the mechanism of division uh, of cells. Uh, he did this work on grasshoppers. He observed that it, it appeared to be, uh, in fact, chromosomes that seemed to occur in pairs uh, and split during uh, meiosis and then subsequently recombine independently. And so, Sutton was able to explain that the phenomenon that he observed, in fact, the phenomenon that Mendel observed several years earlier, could be applied to, to the cells of living organisms at the cellular level, which was very important because it seemed that he was able to explain the mechanism uh, for the observations that uh, Mendel made several years earlier. Uh, Theodore Bovary, German scientist, observed just about the same phenomenon working with sea urchins, and so between the two of them, they put forth what is now known as the Bovary Sutton chromosome theory, uh, which essentially states that chromosomes are, in fact, the basis of genetic inheritance. These two sets of, of discoveries, uh, I believe they capture some salient aspects of, of scientific discoveries in general. Uh, slides look a bit off, I believe they capture the salient aspects of scientific discoveries in general. Uh, I believe that scientific to make discoveries, there typically is a human. If, uh, if you can't hear me, please let me know. I'll stand a little bit further. So I, I believe that discoveries consist of a human. Uh, there are observations. The human makes a series of observations. We process these observations and attempt to generate uh, an explanation. If the explanation is consistent, then the humans will put forth in theory. If no theory exists, uh, if the theory already exists, then they may confirm, invalidate, or elucidate the existing theories. Uh, humans are able to do this, I believe, because they're able to process context. Uh, in the case of Sutton, he was able to, to essentially make an association between what he observed and what Mendel observed because of his experience, his, his acumen, his insights, his background knowledge. Machines are not able to process, I think, as well, context as, as can humans. And so, 
In today's technological era in which we are developing computational systems to be able to facilitate discoveries, it is important to put into appropriate context the role of these computational systems. I believe that it is not the role of a computational system to take a series of observations, to take a series of observations, uh, process those observations, attempt to produce an explanation for the observations, attempt to produce a theory, verify, confirm, debunk. Uh, I, I don't believe that this is the role of a computational system. Rather, I believe that the role of a computational system is to take a series of observations, to process the observations, to find logical links, to find promising links within the data, and present those to humans who will ultimately be able to reason across that data to arrive at an explanation, to generate, confirm, debunk, elucidate an existing theory. Because I believe humans ultimately will make the discoveries because they, they are able to, to use their, their acumen, their ability to perceive and reason better than computational systems can. And so, uh, in this kind of framework, the obvious question is, I'm presenting a framework for literature-based discovery, the question we ask is, well, what are these promising links? How do you develop your computational system so that it is able to find these associations across the observations and present them to, to the human so that knowledge discovery can be facilitated. And so that is the focus of this PhD dissertation uh, proposal. It is to develop a computational system that will process a series of observations to find logical links across those observations, present them to humans who will then be able to, to reason and assimilate that information to essentially make uh, scientific discoveries. When this is done in the context of scientific literature, it is called literature-based discoveries. So we'll get into some related work. So literature-based discovery is very different from existing uh, fields of science. It's a very special kind of science. Uh, LBD is based on the indirect observations of the object of interest. This is distinct from, from other scientific research, like the experiments conducted by Bavaria and Sutton. They were based on direct observations. Uh, Sutton was literally standing in front of a microscope observing the division of cells in the embryos of the grasshoppers. LBD essentially takes a set of observations reported by individuals based on their direct observations and reasons uh, on those indirect, essentially, observations. This makes LBD very, a very powerful way of making discoveries because we know that there are multiple uh, disciplines, there are many experiments being conducted across the spectrum of research, and it's really difficult for any one individual or group to be aware of all of the different scientific reports that are being published. So LBD really is, is very powerful, I believe, in terms of, of finding discoveries by processing all of this information. Of course, uh, the idea that the challenge is to able to make associations. In fact, uh, LBD was founded, uh, really, the field started serendipitously by Don Swanson, in which he, he sort of stumbled on an association between Raynaud disease and fish oil by really reading through the titles of, he started with over 4,000 uh, scientific papers. Uh, Swanson essentially looked at the titles of, of papers on Raynaud and fish oil, and he found that uh, through a manual process that Raynaud disease essentially may be treated by dietary fish oils uh, because these dietary fish oils, they're high in omega-3 fatty acids and that may inhibit uh, three things, platelet aggregation, uh, blood viscosity, and uh, vascular reactivity, which is it sort of promotes vasodilation. So once they made these discoveries uh, credited to work that had been done uh, several years earlier, Hans Olaf Bang and Jorn Dyerberg, two Danish physicians, they had observed that Eskimos in Greenland uh, had a rate of acute myocardial infarction that was 10 times lower than uh, those on the Western mainland. He, they subsequently realized that uh, it was because of the uh, high omega-3 fatty acids. Okay, so much of the, re Swanson formulated his, his methodology into what's known as the AB ABC paradigm, which says that, well, you can make discoveries if you can find these intermediate B connections across two disjoint literatures. Early LBD research uh, used this ABC model uh, using keywords. Keywords are good, but uh, they are not uh, aware of semantics. There may be many uh, syntactic variations of a concept. In 2001, Mark Weber introduced concept-based uh, LBD in which he, he essentially mapped concepts to structured background knowledge. The issue with this is that while you found intermediates, 
uh, there was no explicit uh, meaning, uh, you know, no explicit relationship among the concepts, uh, sort of telling you what the association is. Uh, Dmitry Rostovsky introduced the relation-based LBD in which he used explicit uh, relationships. Dmitry introduced what are called discovery patterns, where he said, well, if I know a substance uh, inhibits some kind of body measure, uh, and when that body measure is high, then it, it causes some kind of disease, then I can say, well, maybe the, su the substance uh, maybe treats the disease. Uh, that also worked fine. It's, it's not, however, really adequate for finding complex associations. And so uh, Bart Wilkowski introduced a graph-based approach in which he tried to find longer associations beyond ABC, essentially creating these graphs uh, of, of links, complex links. Bart's work was good, but it was based on degree centrality. Degree centrality is, is, is really appropriate when you'd like to create a compact, uh, a compact subgraph of things that are highly connected in the literature. Well, if you know much about LBD, you will know that for, uh, for LBD, uh, how, whether something occurs frequently or not frequently or anything in between is not important. What you want is to capture the context. So we had a paper in JBI in which we took this ANS model. Yes? Uh, real quick, it's not a question. Man. As you're having more and more stuff to the bottom, uh, is it possible to have Okay, I'll change the resolution. Yeah, I just want to make sure that the, in the room, um, people can still see it okay. And yes, yes, this is fine. This is. How is that? Is that any better? Um, surprisingly, no. Still the same. It's shrunk um, a little bit, but it's still uh, the bottom is still cut off. Yes, everything's fine. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, I apologize. Uh, right, and so we introduced uh, in, in the JBI, we had a paper in which we, propo we proposed uh, a subgraph model that used both explicit context in terms of putting relationships in these subgraphs, and we also introduced implicit context uh, in terms of, of defining some notion of context for grouping together uh, paths that are related. Uh, this is what we're calling the context-driven subgraph model for literature-based discovery. It's the first contribution of, of this PhD dissertation proposal. Just to give some quick bi uh, background biomedical knowledge, there are two types of biomedical knowledge that can be used for LBD. There's assertional knowledge, which refers to direct reports, uh, direct observations by scientists, such as the things that Sutton and Bavari observe. Uh, there's definitional knowledge, which refers to knowledge that is generally known within the community, they're modeled in structured background knowledge bases. It is unlikely to really make discoveries from those because, well, everyone sort of knows that. You're more likely to make discoveries from the literature. Medline is, uh, is the largest biomedical repository from which uh, uh, biomedical uh, discoveries uh, can, can be derived. Uh, Medline documents are indexed with what are called mesh descriptors. Uh, that's the medical subject headings. It, it's tantamount to keywords that are used to index um, papers that you have. Uh, and so these mesh descriptors, they really form one level of abstraction of the actual content. One can think of the mesh descriptors as a semantic summary of source of the information contained in the text. On the second level, there are semantic predications or triples that have been extracted from the text. Uh, these are subject predicate object associations uh, that, that form a second level of abstraction on the text. Semantic predications are important because uh, when we take the semantic predications and put them into a graph, they essentially can be a research-rich uh, sort of framework from which discoveries can be made. And so given that literature is, is disjoint, it's also complementary, uh, then really leveraging the graph of semantic predications for LBD is really a very good thing to do. The medical subject headings, they're twofold. They, while they serve as, as this level of abstraction over the, the information and the content, uh, they also are part of definitional knowledge because they're arranged in a hierarchy. The UMLS is... Uh, the authority on definitional knowledge in uh, 
uh, biomedical literature. So now we get into some more details. If you take all the literature on A, Raynaud, all the literature on C, uh, fish oil, and you put them into a graph, a graph of semantic predications, of triples, what you end up with is something like this, which is a very complex labyrinth. It's very difficult to decipher and glean anything from this kind of, uh, of a graph. What we would like to do in this subgraph model is essentially deconstruct or, or filter that predications graph to be able to find these uh, uh, meaningful subgraphs. Uh, that essentially partition the data on various dimensions. You want one of the subgraphs to be on blood viscosity, another one to be on platelet aggregation, another one to be on vasodilation, if, if that can be achieved. And so the subgraph model that we propose, it starts with the predications graph, and then we construct what's called the reachability relation. Reachability is the notion of being able to get from one point in a graph uh, to another point. Uh, and to do that, you simply find all the paths that connect uh, two nodes. Uh, if, you, if you're not careful with this, you can end up recovering the entire predications graph. You don't want that. We impose a, rest a length restriction on the paths so that from the predications graph, we extract out essentially for Raynaud fish oil all the paths of length three or four that connect them. The, the idea then is to take that uh, reachability relation and to decompose it or deconstruct it into sets of subgraphs such that each of the subgraphs they contain a distinct dimension or a distinct context like I said one on blood viscosity one on, on platelet aggregation and so forth you'd like to do this such that no two subgraphs have the same context the challenge of course is well how do you define context to be able to do this in the JBI paper we took the advice that Dan Gould and IBM gave when you have a complex problem you start with the most simplistic solution uh, in this case it would be to simply have human uh, domain experts essentially try to put together subgraphs uh, from, from the reachability relation. And we did this. We applied this to the rain on fish oil scenario, and here's one of the subgraphs that we were able to create after we, we took all of the 65 articles that Swanson essentially used, we extracted triples from them, we put them into a graph, and we had the domain scientists sit down and look through about 200 uh, or so uh, subgraphs. The first, uh, the first hop here in this subgraph says that dietary fish oil uh, disrupt platelet aggregation. Platelet aggregation, it's a cell function when someone suffers a cut, uh, then the blood platelets, they coagulate around that cut to stop the bleeding. Uh, it's also part of the immune system, it, it's a defense mechanism. So uh, when your platelet aggregation is disrupted, then your blood flows more freely. The flip side of that is you can have, you can be anemic and you can you know, bleed, bleed out. Uh, so what we're finding here is that these fish oils, they disrupt platelet aggregation, okay? We saw the second half that said epiprostanol, which is some icosanoid or something. At this point, no one really cares. Uh, that also disrupts platelet aggregation. Then we saw that epiprostanol treats Raynaud syndrome, okay? This is interesting, but really doesn't tell us what the fish oils have to do with, uh, with Raynaud's. We found another, pa another path, however, which says that dietary fish oil, they stimulate epiprostanol, meaning they, they produce epiprostanol. Well, if this is correct, then the fish oil, they produce epiprostanol, which actually disrupt the platelet aggregation, uh, which probably means that the platelet aggregation is causing this Raynaud syndrome, and this is perhaps the mechanism of disrupting uh, is through this epiprostanol thing. We found another path uh, which showed that Prostaglandin PGI3 also is an epiprostanol, which therefore means that that perhaps also disrupts platelet aggregation. We found another path which says that prostaglandins are, con are produced essentially by dietary fish oil, and one can extrapolate that, well, if epiprostanol is a prostaglandin, then it would seem that the set of prostaglandins are essentially dis the mechanism by which uh, dietary fish oils are disrupting platelet aggregation so that uh, uh, it, it sort of may treat uh, Raynaud. This was important to find, all the way, be it manually, uh, because up to this point in the literature, the best that anyone had done was to simply find that dietary fish oil, platelet aggregation, and Raynaud syndrome co-occur. Can you go back? Yes. So, um, uh, what do we have in terms of uh, subgraphs for the verbs like, uh, you know, in the relationships like disrupts and simulates and converts to, uh, all of them have you know, in the sentences that scientists would use in the literature, there would be many different terms, right? Yes. So what do we have that uh, is uh, uh, useful in terms of having, you know, 
treat all the synonyms as the same thing. So this is part of, of SEMREP, which is a tool for triple extraction from biomedical literature developed by Tom Reinflesch. Yeah. Um, and they, they have uh, implemented what are called indicator rules that use the UMLS uh, schema uh -huh. uh, and uh, use the permissible relationships and using the uh, specialist lexicon. Uh, and, and I'm not entirely sure on the details of how Tom does that. It's a rule-based approach where he's able to map uh, lexical variants of relationships uh, through that process. But the lexical variant is not the same as uh, you know, a totally different term that is used to mean the same thing. Right, and so SEMREP has, I think, about 70, 72 percent or so precision, mm -hmm. and, and this would be one of the, the reasons, um, one of the difficulties. Uh, uh, but if, if, if somebody invests time, uh, uh, you know, in uh, coming up with uh, vocabulary of all these kind of important relationships yes. and their uh, variants, uh, perhaps even uh, some sort of uh, uh, analysis, uh, you know, that um, uh, I guess uh, does something like LSA on the, uh, the you know, and, and finds these are alternative, and human decides they are the same, and then you put it in the dictionary. Uh, this would be the kind of thing to discuss with Tom Reinflesh. Uh, uh, if you can enhance SEMREP in some way using some other technique. The, the other point, other quick question is, um, you said that there were 2,200 subgraphs created, which is fine, and that, uh, you know, scientists looked at that, which is fine as part of the, yeah, you said 200 subgraphs were created uh, when you uh, analyze 65 uh, Oh, yes, papers, yes, yeah. 200 paths, 200 paths, oh, individual paths, paths. Okay. yes. Um, so this, how many paths this has? Uh, 15 or something, I believe. And uh, what happened to the 185? Uh, they were put into other subgraphs. Uh, and so they think how many total subgraphs were there? Could you, you, did you present the scientist subgraphs or the relationships? Uh, so that's in the JBI paper. There were probably about 15 subgraphs, I think. Yeah. Okay. And, and there were many singletons, of course, fast that did not go into subgraphs. Because they didn't share any So my question was typically, um, if uh, a tool can be developed that can give you. Uh, five, ten of them, that would be fine. Uh, if you, you have uh, 50 of these subgraphs, which are all complex, uh, I think we will dissuade scientists. You, will, you know, scientists will say the most number of subgraphs that I've produced in this work is 11. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, in fact, for testosterone and sleep, I have the corpus of 120,000 documents, and I produce 11 subgraphs. That's not bad. Yeah, I have a clarification question. So the repo, both gross canal and filter aggregation, that connection, and Treats. So those two are in two different papers. Uh, they could be. They could be. Um, so this example come from two different papers, and, uh, and what we had to abuse was that this causes this is a possibility. And this is and where how these three are connected? Right. I I, I didn't verify uh, which papers uh, contributed which uh, triple. Yeah, uh, but they, they could. I mean, they obviously, they could. Yes. And that would be the point of really using this kind of graph-based model, where you simply just yeah, that is a case we should probably make that explicit. Yeah. Uh, I yes. Uh, given that this lecture is getting a very full Q and A mode, would you mind repeating uh, the questions for the people on the phone? So uh, that is that done? Uh, it, it is. It's done. You're able to hear your answers perfectly. <laughs> Not the questions. Is it on the other? Uh, it is. It? Thank you. The the question uh, Dr. Prasad has is whether. Uh, do I know whether or not the, the triple that says epiposnol treats Raynaud syndrome uh, and any of the other triples if they occur in the same paper? Um, I, uh, the Raynaud uh, fish oil literature, uh, it's two disjoint uh, sets of literature, the fish oil literature and Raynaud, I think they only had four articles in common and of those four, only two of them were actually talking, in, they mentioned Raynaud fish oil. Uh, in some kind of context, uh, but not in, in the context of uh, fish oil treating uh, a rayon. So I don't believe that, that those facts were there. If they were, then this would not be an based discovery because at least one person would have explicitly said so. Okay, right, so this is significant because up to this point, the best that anyone had done was really just uh, found that these three things were associated. The, Dmitry Arostovsky was the first person who applied his discovery patterns to find them. But then, I mean, the question is, obviously, how do you automate this kind of, of subgraph creation? Uh, it would be difficult to, to sort of know the, the complex context ahead of time. You just really don't know it. And you could try to develop a, a technique that uses uh, degree centrality and so forth, graph-based, 
metrics and uh, statistical metrics, but then it's probably not, not, not that easy. So how do we do this automatically? Uh, before we get into that, linguistics and semantics are inherently tied, and so we just want to deal with that just a bit. Uh, to approach the problem of automatic subgraph creation, uh, we treat the problem as one of clustering paths that are related, not paths that are similar. If we cluster together paths that are similar, we'll end up with information that people already know. It's essentially like this summary of information that people already know. That's not where the discoveries are. The discoveries are, are where things are associated in some way, they're related in some way, but it's not really known. They, they, some context, underlying context. So we approach the problem as one of path relatedness. Well, since we know that a path uh, consists of a set of triples or a set of semantic predications, then we can decompose the problem into one of, of predication relatedness, essentially. We can ask the question, well, what is the context of a, a particular triple uh, within, the, within the path? And if we can define that context, then we can put together things that essentially share the same context. So the question is obviously, well, how do you find the context of a semantic predication so that you can essentially do this? We make an assumption. The assumption that we make is that the article in which a triple or a semantic predication appears, uh, the, the semantic attributes of that article are inherited by the triple. This would be equivalent to saying for a, a, an abstract of a scientific paper published in DBLP, uh, if there's a triple extracted from that abstract, then whatever keywords are used to tag the abstract, you assume that the keywords are inherited by the triple. What would be nice is if, in fact, uh, someone sat down and actually indexed the triples with the, with the semantic attributes directly. In the absence of that, we make the assumption that the, the triples, they inherit the, the, the semantics of the, in this case, it's mesh descriptors. Mesh descriptors are, are assigned by humans uh, as, as capturing the salient points of the article, essentially say, well, this article is talking about testosterone, uh, hypogonadism. Uh, it's, it's manually verified uh, and described by, by experts. So if, if this assumption is true, then we can make a second assumption, which is that the distribution of the mesh descriptors uh, for a single predication across all of the literature essentially captures some kind of a context. And this is very consistent with, uh, with distributional semantics. This is a standard part of, of uh, LSA and a random reflexing indexing in which uh, you assume that a keyword can be represented in terms of the other keywords with which it co-occurs. This can be attributed to John Rupert Firth, who is noted for presenting uh, discussions on the context-sensitive context nature of meaning, in which he says, well, to truly understand a word, you have to understand the context of that word. Uh, in fact, he's famous for the quotation which says that you shall know a word by the company it keeps. That is to say, linguistic items with similar distributions, they have similar meanings. We're simply extending that to say that assertions or triples uh, with shared context in their distributions, uh, they are related, not, not similar. We're looking for relatedness. Okay. Uh, I, I have my own bold uh, statement of my own. You shall know a semantic predication in terms of the distribution of its mesh descriptors. Now, suffice to say that one can represent a semantic predication at various levels. You can represent a predication in terms of the keywords with which it co occurs. This would be almost exactly what people do with, with keyword, with uh, P PMIs. You can represent it in terms of the other concepts with which it co occurs. You can represent it in terms of the mesh descriptors that are used to tag the articles where it occurs, as we have done here. At a higher level of complexity, you can represent it in terms of the other semantic predications with which it, it co occurs. And even more complex, you can represent it as an ensemble of features where you have to use logistic regression to determine the weights of these various uh, attributes and you can come up with some complex model. We have chosen the mesh descriptors because mesh descriptors are assigned by humans to the scientific articles. And so we assume that the mesh descriptors are in fact highly semantic and, and in fact fairly accurate. And so this is the motivation for our choice. The overall philosophical idea here is then that to, to find related objects, then related objects essentially they share similar context in their distributions. Okay, so now we're going to get into some details. To automatically create these subgraphs based on this, uh, this model where we represent a, a 
path in terms of the distribution of its mesh descriptors. If, going back to the really artificial uh, graph, if we were trying to determine the relatedness between these two paths, what we would do is we would lay out each of the paths. We know that each path, uh, excuse me, we know that for the first path, it consists of a set of predications. We know that each of those predications, they occur uh, with some set of documents in the literature. We know that each document is tagged with some set of mesh descriptors. Uh, and therefore, we can aggregate the mesh descriptors for each of the predications. And we can end up with some kind of a vector of, of mesh descriptors. If we do this across uh, both of the paths, then we essentially end up with two predication context vectors, essentially two mesh vectors. Uh, the question then of relatedness really becomes, well, what is the semantic relatedness of the two mesh vectors? Uh, this, folks, is the second contribution of this uh, PhD dissertation proposal. It is the representation of the context of a path as a vector of mesh descriptors. Suffice to say, uh, a point that I make, uh, made before, these uh, vectors, these mesh descriptors, while they're used uh, to capture some kind of a context of an article and they appear to be in a flat list here, they are part of the mesh hierarchy and so we can use uh, th those hierarchical relationships to gain further context if that is if that is necessary. That's what I was, so I was thinking about that issue in that uh, you do have the concepts, mesh, mesh terms, but uh, the relationships are very uh, uh, limited. What, what could you do to really um, exploit the relationships better in this context? Uh, we have used the mesh descriptors. Um, like I said, the ideal case would really be, uh, well, of course, a lot of the mesh descriptors were directly assigned to the triples. That would really be good. Uh, beyond those two things, it's something that I would really have to think about. Uh, I, I mean, what, you know, what, where, where would the relationship, name relationships go here? In the mesh hierarchy, it's just, uh, it's just it's categorized. Just so it's just is, all right? Yeah. Um, That's uh, not that does not give you causes here. No, no, and then the mesh hierarchy, you don't have that at all. So one, one could use, uh, instead, of, so instead of using the mesh descriptors, if you, use the, if you use concepts, right, if you represented the predication in terms of the concepts with which it co-occurred, then you could go into the UMLS and then you have relationships. Uh, the problem with that is that the, the UMLS hierarchy is it's not, the UMLS is not an ontology, it's a terminology. So once you start reasoning on the hierarchy, uh, uh, you really end up with inconsistency, right? because it's not a, a really robust kind of ontology. It's just well, a, a you don't need to reason. You just need to put layout. Uh, these are all the relationships that are there. Maybe you just, uh, uh, in addition to your uh, mesh term space vector, uh, you just uh, say these are the, uh, you know, put identifiable relationships that I have. Uh, see if that can give you any more information. Really. I think this really makes the case for an ensemble-based approach where you're not just using mesh descriptors, mm -hmm. right? You use a number of different things, and you, mm -hmm. uh, that's a very, very complex sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I think it's a good thing to do. So uh, given these uh, mesh vectors and what's happening here, I'm representing the two parts uh, where each of these circles represents a distinct and unique mesh descriptor and the counts represent the counts of those descriptors across the entire path. So here's the first predication vector. We're assuming that this first mesh descriptor occurs three times in the first path, and this other one occurs five times in the other path. Well, what, what these are at this point are not really important. Uh, the point I want to make here is that when you see this kind of representation, you have two vectors, essentially, whose relatedness you would like to compute. Some, some people may say, well, you can use cosine similarity to do this. Let's think about that very carefully. If we use cosine similarity to compute the relatedness uh, between these two paths, this is what would happen. For the, first of all, you'd have to represent the two vectors on the same dimensions. So for all of the, the mesh descriptors that are in the second vector that are not in the first, you sort of have to represent them with zero frequencies. Okay, uh, that would mean that for all of these uh, out of context descriptors, the, the uh, numerator here is just the product of the frequencies, the sum of the product, all of those things would essentially contribute zero to the overall score. That's, uh, that's this, this area here. Uh, the, the score in the top is five times three plus two times one plus three times zero. Because all of these are zero, then it, it's three times zero, two times. That's not really what's, what's troubling, though. What's really troubling is that for all of the out of context descriptors in the second vector, then you have to divide uh, in the numerator 
by the square of those frequencies. Well, what that does is it really, really all that we are interested in is knowing what shared context these two vectors have. We're not really interested in, in their frequencies for digital based discovery. It's really about context, not, not about frequencies. So, so just, just a really uh, different way of thinking here. Um, instead of uh, looking at this whole thing as a vector, what if you were to take some subset of the stuff mm -hmm. and just find the relatedness of subsets? So you have loosely coupled pieces that are fancy, but uh, there are pieces that are not very bad. That's where the human judgment comes in. Right? I think that's almost exactly the kind of approach we've taken here. Uh, we have two objectives. The first objective is to maximize the weight of the in-context descriptors, mm. and we minimize the weight of the out-of-context descriptors. Essentially, what we do is we binarize the vectors, mm. ignore the frequencies, mm. just one or zero, present or not, and then for all of the things that are not in the first, uh, that are not shared across them, we essentially ignore them and we just capture the, it's really the intersection at the most simplistic level across the two vectors. In this case, it would be very simple in the V2. Uh, but this is a very interesting kind of thing. If you look very closely, and now I'll add some mesh descriptors to sort of uh, show the complexity. Uh, there are mesh descriptors at the top, the labels for mesh descriptors. Well, what we're seeing here is that platelet aggregation is in both of the two vectors, which is good. Uh, but if you look more closely, you see that platelet activation is in the second vector, but not in the first. But platelet activation and platelet aggregation, if you look in the G tree of the mesh hierarchy, these things are, well, one is the pair of the other. So these things are really very related. Uh, furthermore, if you look uh, more closely again, you see the platelet adhesiveness, which is the sibling of platelet aggregation, is also there. You could imagine that if platelet aggregation was not in the second vector, and these two uh, things were in the second vector, if you were looking at just a mere intersection, your score would be zero. Well, I mean, they are more related than just that, right? Yeah, because I these things I are have simple. A so, so, in order to make this uh, called really semantic, right, the two issues that you need to address is when you add uh, those numbers yes. to get the numbers, right? So, when you move it from, say, from one end of the, the part to the other end, we need to somehow understand what the implications are. For example, there are two parts, and you have some concepts at one extreme and the other concepts on the other extreme. Mm -hmm. The way you are collapsing, they are turning out to be the same thing. I mean, is that semantically meaningful? Oh, no, no, no. Do not, I, I wouldn't say that they're the same thing. Uh, there are intermediates in between them, right? And so, the right, but, but, but think about a, a, a path and it's, it's a reversal sort of thing, right? I mean, the way you are summarizing it using these count-based vectors, we need to somehow justify that this is a semantically meaningful way of summarizing the path. And we need to look at some examples to make sure that uh, that's the case. And the second thing is about, like when you said uh, these other colored concepts are not uh, appearing, does that mean they are not? So they, you still need to reason with respect to these background knowledge, and they may actually collapse to the ones in the prefix, right? Uh, I mean, th those ones at the end, right? I mean, yeah, sure. Are so you saying that they are not semantically related, or if you have enough background well, knowledge, you may be able to collapse it into... Uh, in this anecdotal example, I'm saying that they're not related, but I mean, they could be. Essentially, what you would do is, uh, across each pair of mesh descriptors, you would look at the at the, related, the similarity score, rather, the mesh similarity score, using the background knowledge. Right? And if these, if their similarity is above some threshold for semantic similarity, then you would in, in, include them in your accounts. Uh, and so that's exactly what uh, what is done. This is to show you the post line and the post and all the rest of it. If you did this, then you would compute the pairwise relatedness or mesh semantic similarity scores, uh, and then you sort of aggregate and you extend your overall score. Uh, and that's what we've done. The obvious question is, well, how do you set this threshold for mesh semantic similarity uh, so that this actually works? We manually set this threshold because we have no idea how to do this, and so we take our first black eye at this point. Uh, semantic similarity is something that's very subjective. Um, while a, a car and an airplane may be, may be similar uh, in the general domain of travel, uh, a car and an airplane may be no way similar whatsoever in the in the general scope of travel by land, right? And so, 
determining a threshold for semantic similarity of mesh descriptors, it's something that, that has to be subjective, has to be domain specific. I mean, we have to really sort of think about that. And at this point, we have simply used the dice similarity score, and we've just manually set some threshold. Uh, and we'll just sort of see how this works out. Now, we do have some ideas for how to, to, to kind of optimize this uh, based on familiarity with all of the various uh, metrics for semantic similarity. In fact, uh, my young Padawan Swapnil Sony has implemented uh, several of these uh, uh, semantic similarity measures, and we do have those scores. We're just uh, really not sure yet how to, to implement that and to uh, come up with an optimal score. Towards the end, I'll come back to this and we'll get some ideas. Don't worry, I mentioned this when we were talking, but I just want to keep it in your mind that it, it would make sense to me to continue to think about weighting as you move down the hierarchy because clearly two papers that are about platelet aggregation yep. and have that as a descriptor are more similar and related than two papers that have one descriptor, but that's a very high level descriptor, like circulatory yes. disorders. Yes. Absolutely. This is a good idea. Uh, the, the existing uh, so the, the uh, Dr. Raymond was saying it would be uh, a good idea to take into account the specificity of the pairs of mesh descriptors in the mesh hierarchy. That's to say, uh, you might want to to say that two mesh descriptors uh, are more uh, similar uh, based on their their level in the tree. Two papers rather are more similar. Um, Let's say if two papers are in platelet aggregation, you can still beat them to the tree four or five. Uh, they, they ought to have a higher score than if they're just up at the second level, which is just circulatory disorder or something of that sort. The these semantic similarity measures, they, they try to do this, but not exactly as Dr. Raymer had said. They do take into account the path length of the new bomber, uh, leak off shutter are based on that. Uh, but I think it may come down to actually defining our own metric, really, based on the semantics of our problem. Oh, you get some other uh, uh, This is David Bauman here. Yes. Actually, uh, uh, one uh, In fact, they do, um, I, I still believe that uh, this really may come down to, to us just defining some kind of metric that's appropriate. In any event, this is the kind of thing that uh, I don't know how to figure out, or I haven't figured out yet, and I certainly will be relying on, on you know, the expertise of, of many people uh, to be able to, to do properly. Yeah. I, I think if you use this course, right, with the uh, asymmetric, I think we have spoken about mm -hmm. it, asymmetric cosine similarity, mm -hmm. and then uh, just try to decay it over the hierarchical levels. Mm -hmm. If you have a more specific uh, Mesh descriptor. Right. Once you are uh, right. opting for its hierarchy level, just decay it over. Okay. You might have to find the decay. It cannot so be at, uh, here's the thing. <laughs> right. I, I agree with you fully. Uh, the the use of, of frequencies uh, and uh, this is just a general point. In in general, I mean, they may work uh, quite well, but they're probably just not easy. And this really captures one yes. case in which it's really not easy to make right. it work. Uh, the overall framework that we've developed, a context-driven subgraph model, it's a little bit more intuitive than, than uh, the frequency-based kinds of things. Yeah. Okay. So uh, if we did this uh, using the mesh hierarchy essentially to extrapolate the context, then you end up with a score of five, not three. Uh, and unfortunately, this is the second, third rather, contribution of this research, which is the, the use of structured background knowledge to define the shared context between uh, two paths. Uh, an unfortunate side effect of doing this is that, well, two paths that are very similar, uh, and they're also, well, they are obviously also related, um, but two paths that are very similar, they will end up with this really high score. Uh, two others that are related for our purposes above some threshold of path relatedness may have a lower score, albeit. Uh, we, we apply a log reduction on the scores just so that the scores are not, uh, you know, really difficult to deal with, to really minimize the, the difference between things that are basically related. Uh, a, a, a positive side effect of doing this is that the, the log reduction, as we have done it, it actually corresponds to what's known as the, as the Lorentzian distance, which is a measure uh, from, it's a variant of Euclidean distance, really just a log on that. There's this book called The Dictionary of Distances that I would suggest be bought for <laughs> folks in the lab. It's perhaps one of the, uh, the best books I've, I've ever stumbled on. Uh, all things uh, uh, similarity, all semantic similarity, distance metrics. Okay. So doing this log reduction, 
Uh, then it therefore means that we have a way for computing the relatedness between two paths, uh, given that we are enforcing this threshold manually for the, the semantic similarity of the mesh descriptors in the two vectors. Right? The, the next thing to do then is really to just go ahead and cluster the two paths. Just perform your clustering algorithm and put things into, into the same bin if, they are, if they're sufficiently related. Uh, to do this, we choose the hierarchical abramative clustering algorithm. We're making no novelty claims here whatsoever. Someone can implement a different clustering algorithm. I, I saw a paper that did heavy in learning on, on mesh descriptors to create subgraphs. Uh, if that works, then that's fine. We're making no, no claims to novelty. The hierarchical clustering, it is convenient because it's an unsupervised algorithm. You don't need to specify the number of, of clusters. Uh, it's deterministic every time you run it. It gives you the same, um, the same output. Uh, it, it also runs in a fairly good running time, although I haven't made any attempt to optimize this. I'm not, at this point, really, really uh, concerned about the scalability. I really would like to see the, the overall performance of this context-driven model. So, to do the clustering, we essentially lay out each of the paths, and this is just hierarchical clustering as it is. We would put each path into a separate bucket. This is the bucket population phase. Uh, we put each path into a bucket, then we compute the relatedness score uh, between that path and every other path, and if a pair of paths have a relatedness score above a second threshold now that I will talk about in just a minute, uh, then we put them into the same bucket. Uh, and you repeat this across all of the input paths until you end up with, uh, uh, with the buckets populated at the first pass. And then the next step is really to merge the buckets. So this is like mesh-based similarity, right? So this is based on mesh similarity, exactly. Yes. And so then in the next pass, what you would need to do is merge the buckets. And you would do this in the same way that you did the, the, the paths. You would assume that each bucket essentially is sort of like a single path. We'd use what's called the inter-cluster similarity that I'll talk about. You would compare across buckets, and if two buckets are sufficiently similar, then you go ahead and you would merge them. Now, if you're not careful with this, you can end up recovering the original reachability relation, which is what you don't want. So uh, it's important to then define another threshold, which is a threshold now for path relatedness. Right? And this threshold you will not set manually uh, because it would not, just not be a proper thing to do. So for those who are interested, this sort of uh, framework is called the dendrogram. Again, uh, this is just standard stuff from, from hierarchical clustering. So just to review before our heads explode, because there's lots of different uh, similarity kinds of things, thresholds, and so forth. Uh, our task at this point is to compute the relatedness between two paths. We are representing a path as a, a vector of mesh descriptors. Uh, we are computing the fuzzy set intersection using the mesh hierarchy, using some kind of Lorentzian reduction on the scores. Uh, we'd like to essentially determine a threshold for path relatedness. Uh, taking Dan Gould's advice, I of course uh, did this manually to begin with, but you, you really would like to automate this. Again, like I said, we manually set the threshold for mesh semantic similarity. So, uh, applied to the Raynaud fish oil experiment, I, I figured out by just tweaking around with the, with the path relatedness score, uh, that a score of three seemed okay. In fact, the score of three gave me that subgraph that I showed earlier, which was nice, again. To be able to, to get that sort of subgraph sort of shows that the semantic predications can be used not only to recover uh, existing knowledge, but to, to elucidate them, to decompose them, which had simply not been done before in the literature. We published this in JBI. Uh, I wanted to do this in a more, in a more uh, respectful way, really, respectful way. And so I looked at the pairwise path relatedness scores uh, using the mesh semantic similarity. Uh, across all, of, that would be 200 by 200 paths, right? You just compute all of the scores, 400,000, I think. Uh, and then you display it on a graph. And this is what I observed. When you look at all of the scores, what you see is that, well, below a score of about 1.5, and this is where the Lorentzian reduction really comes in handy, because now the scale is only from 0 to 3.5, uh, which, which was nice to see because my score was 3. But you see like below 1.5 semantic relatedness for two paths, you have not that many paths. This goes up to 400 on the y-axis, that's the number of paths, path pairs with the same score. Uh, on the x-axis, that's the score. So it, the number of paths that are not that similar is not much. There's a bigger area here up to about 2.5 or so 
where lots of paths have the same kind of relatedness score. And then there's another area beyond that where not that many paths are really, really very related. Now, if you know your statistics, this sort of a representation, this sort of distribution, it is reminiscent of the Gaussian distribution. And so what I did was I computed the, the mean of the values, the standard deviation, the variance, and I actually used the, start, the Gaussian function, and I plotted the Gaussian. And when you plot the Gaussian, you get something that looks very much uh, Gaussian, although I, I must point out, this is not a, a, a perfect Gaussian. In fact, if you did get a perfect Gaussian from your data, you're either extremely lucky or you should be suspicious. Uh, what's happening here is that, again, these scores are not very evenly distributed beyond this, no, 1.25, really. But then there's this big area here where they're, where they're fairly evenly distributed beyond about 2.67 or so. Again, you see it's, the data is kind of sparse. What does part related to the score of 2 mean, actually? Uh, actually, 2, that would be the average of all the scores. That would be uh, the average score of all the 400,000 packs. It's about 2. That's all. What does it mean? Uh, it would be comparable to the average height of all people in the world being about 5'9". It's just uh, a, a measure of the average of distribution of your data. And if two things are identical, they're If two things are identical, they would fall up at three point, whatever that highest score is, essentially. If they're like, completely uh, destroyed, they would be at zero. Which uh, similarity measure are you using? Uh, this is the Lorentzian reduction. This is that path relatedness score that I came up with. Okay. The, okay. This is the, right. So this was nice to see again. What we're seeing, what we're noticing here, that's nice, is my three, my manually set threshold of three. It's sort of in this area. But not to jump to any conclusions, I, I repeated this for a different experiment, the testosterone sleep uh, discoveries. I think it had 230 or so paths, so that's 230 squared. Uh, and it plotted the same thing. Now this looks like a better Gaussian. Uh, what we're seeing though is that, well, it looks like not that many paths uh, are like not related at all. They're somewhat related. Uh, and then the distribution evens out. This is very close to a, a standard Gaussian representation. I did this for a third uh, scenario with DEHB and sepsis, and I, I got a fairly uh, good looking Gaussian. So what was very exciting about this though was that when I I looked at the comparisons of the manual scores and the scores that I saw. Uh, uh, I saw some, some interesting things. If you know much about statistical distribution, Gaussian distribution, you know that the mean of the points in a normal distribution, it's just the average, like I said, the average height of all people in the world. Uh, there are two points of inflection. Uh, these points are of great significance in, in finances and the stock market is used very heavily. Uh, the first standard deviation from the mean on either side, they capture typically in terms of the actual mean, what the, what the data means, it typically corresponds to a shift in, in an event or a phenomenon uh, in your corresponding to a real world scenario. Um, going back to the heights of people across the world, you could think of these, of at least this point of inflection as being the point that demarcates what it means to be tall on the upper hand of that, and anything below that is essentially short. Now, you would have the, the leverage, really, to the latitude to say, well, you know, in terms of my, my data, I'd like to define that point as the second standard deviation from the mean, or as the third, or anywhere in between. You can essentially set a hard value for that, depending on your specific problem. This was nice to see, because when I went back and I looked at the, uh, the, the manual score that I set, and the second and third standard deviation from the mean, what I saw consistently was the manual score of 3.0, it was slightly above the second standard deviation for Raynaud fish oil, and slightly less than the third. For testosterone sleep, it was slightly above, and slightly less than the third. For DEHP sepsis, it was slight, if only slightly above, uh, and uh, below, so it seemed to fall in the middle. Again, when I when I did this, I had no idea about Gaussians or anything like so, that. So, so the pairs of paths you got that cross this threshold is highly similar? Exactly. This is what this allowed me to say. It allowed me to say, and I, I could only really say that because the, the subgraphs that were generated based on the manual threshold 
were of decent quality. Remember for Raynaud fish oil, we are able to, I'll show in just a bit, the actual subgraph that was produced uh, based on the second and third, but using a threshold of three, uh, we got some fairly interesting results. In fact, uh, uh, I'll get to that in perhaps just the next slide. If, if it is true then that, that the second and third standard deviation from the mean are really useful, then all that's really remaining is to actually go ahead and do the clustering, um, uh, which is really the, the bucket population, bucket merging. Uh, the bucket merging, we, we have used the uh, inter-cluster similarity, which is this third measure. Uh, uh, single link and complete link, uh, group average, they're just not really convenient for, for this problem. And again, these things are coming from the, the Chris Manning book, uh, Introduction to Information Retrieval. The inter-cluster similarity, what it does is it takes each path in each of the two buckets you're trying to merge, and it computes their path-relatedness score, uh, and then it does the, the average. And if that average is also above your threshold, then you merge them. And we did that uh, for ranking the clusters after you, you compute the, their, after you run the algorithm through the algorithm terminates when the different the number of clusters in this iteration and the previous iteration has not changed. And I think I've had it most like three or four iterations. Once you do that first cluster, that first bucket population, because it's based on this context. Uh, then it's really things settled on very quickly. Uh, right. But actually, but what does that mean? So su suppose uh, I have very few paths that convey the same thing, right? And if you take two dissimilar paths, then they have a small relatedness. But that doesn't by itself tell me anything about how good each path is, right? Well, in terms of the mesh descriptors, it does. Uh, if, if, the, if the distribution of their mass descriptors, this goes back to by J.R. Forth and, and all of those kinds of things, the basis for the representation, this goes back to LSA. If, if the distribution, if you have two terms, right, with, represented by term vectors, if the uh, relatedness score, similarity score in that case, two documents represented by two document term vectors, if their scores are not sufficiently similar based on your threshold for document similarity, well then you assume that the documents are not similar. Okay, but that doesn't say anything about the validity of each path by itself. Not necessarily. No, I mean, what we'd like to do is essentially put paths together that share some context based on our definition. Uh, and, and so this is sort of reasonable to do. Uh, after you've created the, the clusters, then we rank them by the intra-cluster uh, similarity rank, which is just to say, take all of the paths within the cluster compute the pairwise relatedness scores, and then average that out. Uh, if you rank it by the highest to lowest, what that would mean is you would get the, the clusters that are sort of compact, right? They, they're very sort of similar within that context, or very related within that context. You could rank this in the, in the inverted, using the inverted rank, where you want those clusters that, you know, those paths that have come together in, a, in the same bin or bucket, but they're sort of farthest away from each other. This is where the real discoveries lie, I believe, where things are, you know, they're in the neighborhood, they're in the context, but not so much. Uh, to, to do that would really just be inverting the, the, the ranked uh, list. So, so use related paths to evaluate the similarity of two documents. Is that where you think there will be some interesting discoveries? Uh, not documents. We, use, we essentially cluster together related paths. Okay. Uh, and we believe that the, the concepts, the relationships uh, within the, the cluster, essentially, uh, might point to some interesting information, essentially. It's not the document, but the, so the, yeah, the document. associated, extracted from those documents. Right, the triples extracted from the, no, again, you, you could think, I said this in the slide of background knowledge, the, the paths in a cluster, you could think of them as one level up, and they have hanging on to them. Like uh, oranges on a tree, the, the documents from where they were extracted, and it would be just a long list, right? right? You could think of, of uh, the keywords in those documents as right. also so to hanging. Me, to me, each part, each part in the BKR is telling you a bunch of related documents, documents. that allow you to connect uh, things. Yes, yes. The, the thing is, you don't want to. You want to be careful about the metric that you use to define uh, the relatedness of paths, because you don't want like documents that are similar necessarily, right? You just want information that is related within some context. Um, that's really what you want. Uh, so uh, the last thing here, and we're sort of winding down, 
uh, there's a number of, of paths that will essentially not end up in any buckets. They're called singleton paths. They don't share any context based on our definition of context. That is not to say that they don't share any context in reality based on our definition. Uh, to rank those based on the intra-cluster similarity does not make sense. I mean, there is no, there are no scores. So, well, uh, what we do here is, I actually haven't implemented this, but the proper thing to do would be to rank them by frequencies. This is what has been done in, in the literature. Right? Uh, you rank the intermediates based on their frequency, TFID or whatever you choose. You just rank them on frequencies. And I'm certain that if there's interesting information to be found according to the history of the research in this area, uh, then, well, this would be the sort of logical way to find it. My astute colleague, Shriyan, suggested that, well, perhaps, you know, you could go to the background knowledge uh, across all of the singletons. And you go one step up in, in the hierarchy and you say, well, I'll group together things that, uh, that share some kind of semantic similarity based on the background. Now, I think this is a brilliant suggestion and it's something to be explored. But having uh, defined this overall framework, just to review a set of metrics because we've talked about lots of things, uh, I have computed the relatedness between two paths. Each path is represented as a vector of mesh descriptors. That's because each path consists of a set of triples. Each triple or each predication occurs in a document that's been tagged by humans with uh, mesh descriptors. So you have a vector, essentially, of, of mesh descriptors for a triple based on all the documents where that triple occurs. Uh, we have, in fact, used this fuzzy set intersection business where we've expanded the context of a path by going into the mesh hierarchy. Uh, using some log reduction, and uh, we have a threshold for mesh semantic similarity that I have set manually. Uh, this is something that needs to be addressed in the future. This is certainly a limitation. Uh, and we have used the threshold for path relatedness as both the second and third standard deviations from, from the mean of the Gaussian distribution of the pairwise uh, relatedness scores. For, for the relatedness or similarity of buckets, it doesn't matter at this stage because each bucket really contains paths that have uh, some kind of context. Uh, we know each bucket is a set of paths, and so we use what's called the inter-cluster similarity, which is to compute the pairwise scores uh, across each of the two paths, and then we just average that. Whichever paths, whichever buckets are above the same threshold, uh, the second Gaussian from the mean, second, third, then we merge those. And to rank the buckets, we essentially use the intra-cluster similarity for hypergraphs, which are essentially subgraphs that have more than one path. And for singletons, we, we will implement some kind of frequency-based measure. That's, that's a trivial thing to do. OK, so now we get to the experiments, and they're really sort of winding down, because these other circles, uh, they don't take much, uh, very long to go through. What have we done with this? We first, in the summer, uh, we applied the manual <coughs> threshold for path relatedness to be able to cluster things together because at that time I had not figured out all of the Gaussian stuff. When you manually use this threshold of three for Raynaud fish oil, uh, on, this is what happened. Uh, we ended up with, I think, about 14 or 15 subgraphs. I hadn't done any merging of buckets. I, I stopped the algorithm after one run just to see what's there. If you didn't see anything there, then it probably would set off a uh, yeah, panic attack because perhaps this might not have been working. Well, I looked through, I think, about the third bucket or so, um, and then I saw this. Well, this is very striking, because what we're seeing here from the manually created path by the domain scientists, we're seeing Raynaud, we're seeing fish oil as the subject. This is no surprise. We see uh, Raynaud as the object. But what we see in this path is platelet aggregation with the disrupts relationships. We see the set of prostaglandins. Uh, Epiprostanol is PGE2, uh, PGI3, prostaglandin itself. And in my set of prostaglandins here, I also see very much the same thing. There's epiprostanol, the, that is a prostaglandin, and alprostadil is actually PGE1, not PGA3, which is interesting because uh, we didn't really put PGE. Uh, I think it, PGE1 uh, uh, is in one of our other subgraphs, not in this one. According to the algorithm, it automatically put these in here. This is very interesting to see. The bigger question, though, is, well, when you apply the second and third standard deviation from the mean, what do you get? Trying the second, second standard deviation first. Before I get to that, what excites me particularly about this subgraph is that platelet aggregation is a type cell function. 
Uh, all the prostaglandins, they're of type icosanoid, pharmacologic substance, biologically active substance. If, if you can have a frequency-based or graph-based technique put into the same bucket, things that are of disparate semantic types, that would be good. I would, I would venture to say that that would probably not be all that easy. The only reason why these things ended up in the same bucket is because they share a context in terms of the distribution of the image descriptors. My feeling is you'd have to use heuristics to be able to, to do this. The problem is, how do you prevent all of the other cell functions <laughs> from getting into that bucket? How do you prevent all of the other icosanoids, all of the other things from getting into the same bucket? This is doing it strictly based on the notion of context which mesh descriptors have been used to tag the documents where these triples occur. This really, really translates to the semantics of these associations. People have written about them, the mesh, the, the experts have said, well, yeah, this is talking about that. And we're clustering paths based on, based on that. Okay, when we applied the second standard deviation from the mean implementing the algorithm all the way through, we got four hypergraphs, there were 137 singletons. Again, we're not saying that those singletons are not interesting, we know they are. Uh, we, I looked through the four hypergraphs, and this is one that was produced. The only difference between this subgraph and the previous one is the existence of the TIMP1 gene and the TIMP1 protein. If this were 1986, and you had given this to Don Swanson, he would have been happy, by my estimation. In any, in any event. Uh, after using the third standard deviation, what you're worried about is, well, you know, maybe the third standard deviation is too restrictive, and so the meaningful paths will not get into the same bucket. Well, we got exactly what we got when we set the threshold manually. We got the same thing. Uh, someone could say, well, you know, on 65 articles, this is not shocking. I probably can implement TFIDF, cosine similarity, and some other things, PMI, to get this. And you may. We applied this to the testosterone and sleep discovery that Tom Reinflesch made uh, in 2011 with Chris Miller, where uh, by the way, I found everything on plate with aggregation after doing this in those four hypergraphs. When you apply this to testosterone and sleep, where the input corpus now is not 65 documents, but 120,000, and we had to create the predications graph, create the reachability relation, filter out concepts like disease and patients that's not meaningful, uh, essentially filter down, we ended up with about 280 paths. Uh, the question, real question would be whether or not we could recover the, the testosterone sleep discovery using this approach. Just to give some background information, and we're going to wrap up very quickly. Uh, the testosterone sleep discovery uh, is one in which Tom Reinfeldt and Chris Miller sought to elucidate the, the degrade, degradation of sleep in aging men, which is in fact worse than in women. What they found from the literature was that uh, as they found that testosterone levels rise, uh, rather testosterone levels decrease with age in men. Testosterone is also naturally produced during sleep. Uh, further investigation they saw from the testosterone literature that testosterone is in this, uh, it's in this negative covariance relationship with this uh, stress hormone called cortisol. Uh, neg positive, negative covariance, positive covariance, both things increase uh, mutually. Uh, negative covariance, when one increases, the other one decreases. So what they found is that uh, it appeared that as men age, the level of, of testosterone decrease, and so the levels of cortisol increase, and cortisol is known to disrupt sleep. So aging men have poorer sleep quality than women. Okay, I applied the, the subgraph creation algorithm to the 120,000 documents on testosterone and sleep, and again, this was in the summer, I had no idea how to set the threshold, so I stopped the algorithm just to take a look. And well, here it is. Uh, Hydrocortisone or cortisol, that, that's cortisol, same thing. Look on Wikipedia, it's just the new name for, for cortisol. This was very, very exciting to see because it sort of meant that, well, you know, we were on to something. What you really wanted to see, though, is what so would happen. Let me understand what you were doing. So you, you took all the paths yes. from all these documents. Yes. And then uh, connected all the paths that exceeded that threshold, and is that what this was? So we took the 120,000 documents, took each triple from each of those documents, put it into the big black predications graph, then took out paths of length three, I think this is actually length two, uh, that connect them. Uh, there's probably lots, 10,000 or something in the beginning. Then I filtered out relationships like locational, uh, effects, uh, associates, 
uh, produces, and we ended up with essentially about 300, 280 packs. Containing these relationships? Uh, 280 packs where testosterone was the subject and sleep was the object. Okay. Or, well, testosterone was the source and sleep was the target. Mm -hmm. right? And then I clustered them. Uh, using the, the mesh uh, semantic similarity, using the uh, path relatedness that we have defined it, uh, using that reduction thing. And essentially, this is one of the subgraphs that we got. Now, this, again, I stopped the algorithm just to see if this is working, because, you, I mean, if it's not working, then you, know, you sort of have to recalibrate. And we found this. Well, after implementing the algorithm all the way through, uh, then using the second standard deviation, so now it's fully automatic, essentially, right? We got this subgraph. We got, in fact, we got 11 subgraphs. I look, I'm looking here at the second one with 45 paths in it. Uh, it looks a lot more complicated. So all the paths with the greater than two standard deviation is what is collected in this yes. uh, picture. That is, yes, that's exactly, that's correct. Uh, so when you look at this, it looks a little bit convoluted, but it's not really, right? There is five semantic types. These things are semantic groups. These are color coded by uh, the UMLS semantic group. So these are chemicals and drugs. <coughs> these are diseases. These are procedures, the name implies. These are genes. And these are, I don't remember what they are. So, okay, Dr. this is wonderful. I, uh, I want to make sure that you um, uh, emphasize, at least as I understand, two very important things. One is this classic, you know, semantic uh, grouping. You know, these different types of the things because this is, you know, this is what sets you apart from uh, thousands of different uh, statistical and keyword based things. You compare with the work that Nikob Shah is doing in all statistical compared to what you are doing here, I think that that is should be extremely clear. The second thing is, let me see if I understand correctly, of the 49 relationship types in your LS. 54. Uh, enough, you know? Okay. When Kartiko was doing it. Yeah, it's 54. Okay, good. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, so so, so um, you, you you have a set of uh, types, uh, relationship types that are, uh, that are more interesting for you, right? Yes. And you, um, in this uh, tool, you should be able to then select the ones that you want to give higher priority, right? Yes. Okay, good. So again, that's another important form of semantics that you have. Absolutely. And for example, what that would lead is that um, if you are applying this thing of, from a pharma pharmacological uh, 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 perspective, you probably would look at different things. Uh, it, suppose I want to go into cell function aspects of it. Yes. Suppose I want to go. So I think you will have ability to. Uh, choose the relationship types for the application purpose you want, and that may be a very interesting thing to do. Absolutely, yeah. And so there's a semantic way approach uh, for the intended application for you to really uh, uh, call out the graphs of graphs that are of interest. Uh, you know. Absolutely. Instead of showing this complex looking subgraph, we could just show five nodes representing these semantic types, and then let the user drill in. And then drill in, yeah. It's yeah. just the same here. If you look here, I mean, all of these. Uh, <coughs> Ghrelin, hydrocortisone, melatonin, prolactin, these are all hormones essentially. Uh, ethanol, morphine, meacerin, dinoprostine, these are actually drugs. Well, at least they can be put into that class. So if this were just a single node, a yellow node, the user clicks on it, then oh, oh there's hormones here. And you would go in. Well, what I propose is once you have drugs, uh, uh, even if the UMS does not have it, there's be another ontology that may have classes of drugs. Absolutely. As an example, or drugs separated by molecular uh, perspective, and now you'll be able to really dice it in very interesting ways. You know, saying, okay, look, I know this class of drugs are always used. Is there any exception here? Which is, uh, you know, and then now it's something very interesting. What is, uh, what is even nicer, uh, and again, I give credit to my young part of one swap in Sony, is that. Well, one could go to, one could click on one of those paths, essentially, uh, one of those triples, right, and get to the document where the triple was extracted from. And we haven't done this yet. We just wrapped this up. Uh, I think this one is the one for uh, uh, platelet aggregation and alprostadil. And in sentence number 10, it essentially says that PGE1, the addition of 22NM88 NM PGE1 to that resulted in a significant reduction of maximal platelet aggregation. Well, that is that fact. Our prostadil, PG1, disrupts platelet aggregation. So we can then allow, and this is our, our tool we're showing here that Swapnil has worked so uh, diligently on, we're actually showing the subgraphs in a web interface where users can, can use the subgraph and ex essentially explore the information in the literature, right? Go and look at the provenance of the triple. Uh, we, we can provide this as a dimension for exploration. 
of, of any of the subgraphs that we create. Oh, right. <laughs> I mean, this is really interesting. This is exactly the thesis we put forward here that uh, we will provide the ability to, to we'll develop a computational system that will find promising links and present it to humans. And it is humans who ultimately will be able to make the discoveries by going and looking at the provenance, uh, doing your own independent research. To ask a, a computer system to really make discoveries for you is, is really not practical. I mean, it really requires you. But the wrap up here, uh, here it is. Cortisol is here in this graph, even though the graph is so complex. When you go to the third standard deviation, we produce 10 clusters, which is one less. And well, here is cortisol. It's there again. Going back to that second graph, uh, the first graph, uh, Tom, having made the discovery with Chris Miller, looked at this graph and he observed the presence of this concept called ghrelin. Ghrelin is the hunger hormone, uh, cortisol is the stress hormone. Well, they had done their research, they had read over a hundred papers, and they never really come across ghrelin before. So Tom said, well, why is ghrelin here? What's, what's going on? And after doing some research, the literature on ghrelin, it's about 6,600 articles. 133 or 35 of those are on ghrelin and testosterone. Not well elucidated. Uh, the rest of it's on ghrelin and sleep. Uh, there are conflicting reports from the, the ghrelin literature. Uh, there are some articles that state that ghrelin and testosterone, they, they positively covary. That means as, as one increases, so does the other. As one decreases, so does the other. What's interesting, though, is that there's literature that says, well, they negatively covary meaning that as ghrelin levels increase, your testosterone levels decrease. This is exactly the case for the testosterone cortisol sleep discovery. If we have an expert at this point to adjudicate, well, which one is it? If the expert comes out and says, well, you know, it is true, they negatively covary. As testosterone levels decrease, ghrelin levels rise, we would have made a discovery. In fact, what we really would have done is we would have elucidated the existing uh, testosterone and sleep association that is not well known, that Tom and Chris sort of found cortisol as being involved in that process, in this subgraph, automatically, we would have found and presented information to the expert that elucidates that relationship. Which is more, meanserin and dinoprostine. When you look up these things on, on Medline, on PubMed, uh, PubMed and PubMed Central, there's not much information there that one really wants to look into to understand, well, what is the connection? The only reason why these things are in this graph is because they share some kind of context. So you really want to see the actual label for the subgraph, which uh, is part of my future work. I have not been able to label the subgraphs as yet. It's a really complex task. I mean, you have a whole bunch of mesh descriptors, and you have to assign these topic modeling, right? It's not a trivial thing. OK, so we have, in this work, we have, in fact, been able to recover existing knowledge, at least in two cases, uh, and we have been able to elucidate existing knowledge. And this has been done automatically. I've said this before, as a graduate student, this is satisfying for me. I, I feel that, um, you know, I've, I've sort of done something that's, that's interesting. Uh, again, knowledge exploration is what Dr. Sheth uh, talked about. Uh, I had done a paper in BIBM where we actually did some knowledge exploration by going outside of the predications graph into the UMLS uh, for making logical leaps where things are broken. Uh, and this is a fourth com uh, contribution swap there. I thank him for the web application. We'll just continue to, to you know, do that. One last thing of importance. I've talked about context in a lot of different senses. I want to clarify the various levels of context that are, that are involved in this work. And this is really nice. This also excites me. We've talked about context at the level of triples, or semantic predications, as a vector of mesh descriptors. We talked about context at the level of a path as a vector of mesh descriptors aggregated from those uh, predications. We have talked about context at the level of, of shared context between two paths where we use the mesh hierarchy and all of that stuff, which is also mesh descriptors. I have now talked about context in terms of a subgraph, which is what context brought those subgraphs together. What is exciting to me is this idea of context on various dimensions which sort of goes back to the, the first or second slide where I talked about uh, Walter Sutton and Bovary and Mendel, where Mendel did work in, in plant hybridization in one context, essentially. Uh, Sutton did work in cell division, cytology, in a different context. If we have a series of subgraphs where each of the subgraphs have some distinct context, boy, wouldn't it be 
be nice if you can reason across those contexts to be able to, to come up with, with, with information, to make discoveries, like Sutton had to do based on his experience, his insights, his acumen. This is the sort of thing that I sort of fantasize about <laughs> at 5 o'clock in the morning after working really hard. Like, boy, would it be nice if we could do that. This is sort of, I think, the, the broader direction of this research. Okay, four contributions. The context-driven subgraph model that was published in JBI. Definition of the context of a path in terms of a vector of mesh descriptors. Uh, shared context by using the mesh hierarchy and the idea of uh, knowledge uh, exploration or discovery browsing. I've also sh I've already shown my demo. Uh, this is not a silver bullet. The, the, uh, the Gaussian distribution is not perfect. We've computed the chi-square goodness of fit, and the p-value is 0.25. That's way more than 0.05. But we know that the data approximates the Gaussian. There are things like the central limit theorem that can be used to transform a, a non-perfect Gaussian into a more perfect Gaussian. We'll, we'll explore that. The manual threshold for semantic similarity will have to be addressed. You can now imagine that if we took each of those measures, Wu, Palmer, Leacock, Chodorow, and so forth, and we plotted a Gaussian for each of those, we would end up with this mixture of Gaussian. Just simple what you do yeah? This is the kind of thing that we will sort of look at. Uh, we want to ex explore more scenarios with this, possibly look at a, a quantitative uh, 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 a statistical model, essentially, to evaluate the subgraph, give it a number, uh, and then labeling, of course. I've done research on many things. Uh, mainly on text mining and literature-based discovery. Raminta and Dr. Carlson are here. I've worked extensively on Predos, um, and that project has, has really uh, blossomed, I think, into something that, that can make uh, me proud, certainly all of us uh, feel happy about that. I leave you with this quote from H.B. Lovecraft, who is a short story writer. He did the scientific, uh, weird scientific stories. He said that someday the piecing together of dissociated knowledge will open up such exciting, such terrifying vistas of reality that we shall either go mad <laughs> from the revelation or flee from the deadly light into the peace and safety of a new dark age. Some people who can't handle the truth will obviously flee. For those of us who are very progressive, <laughs> we want to move towards the light. This is one case where you want to essentially move towards the light. Thanks to a number of wonderful folks. Uh, thanks to the, the committee. And thanks to you, we are making the truth obvious. Obvious. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I did well over time. <laughs> that was the first thing. Questions? Yes. So I really like the level of context, and you answered my question towards the end as well about the level of context. The point is, how do you get, so the gist of all this uh, approach relies on the quality of terms that you have in the mesh descriptors, right? So in those mesh descriptors, do they have any importance of each of those descriptors? For example, when you compute the path relatedness, you have those context vectors, right? So in that, uh, when we are having a latest measure for particular, like a pair, if that pair is, a, well, one particular pair may be more relevant or more contextually important, from one particular, just like uh, in towards the end, you were thinking about like you saw in the subgraph, right? You wanted from the harmonic side, you might see better. So, based on different levels of what kind of domain that ultimately is serving to, um, yeah. you might actually figure out if certain kinds of pairs are more important or less important. Right. So this is a good question. The question is. Um, Within the distribution of the mesh descriptors, uh, there will obviously be many contexts in that distribution, right? Uh, but if you could figure out a way to sort of weight the, the context, I mean, uh, in platelet aggregation, uh, Raynaud fish oil, I don't know, uh, maybe cell function, uh, just like others do manually, is important over uh, uh, body measure. And so the, the mesh descriptors that are on cell function in that distribution, you might want to say, well, weight them as more important than the ones on body measure throughout. Uh, and so in that way, you really can, you can sort of tune the, the subgraphs that you create. Uh, I think this is a fantastic suggestion, and uh, it's the kind of thing that you'd have to sit down and think about. I, I don't want, at this point, to, to use too many heuristics, but I think that we've sort of gotten the basis for this sort of okay. Uh, for domain scientists, if we have an application-specific version of this for others to use, you might want to add uh, 
these parameters, I don't know, variables for people to choose from, say, well, you know, when you're generating the subgraph, sort of bias towards uh, pharmacologic substance. That would be interesting. Uh, yes, Tom? I think um, uh, this, this is uh, an excellent proposal, uh, and I'm just wondering, uh, you see some limitations. What do you see as the primary challenge in uh, bringing this to the conclusion with optimal results? What do I see as, as a, a challenge in getting optimal results in terms of the overall approach? I, I, you know, I, I think uh, on, on the programming side, I think we need to have the web application done, run more examples and so forth. But I think the subgraphs need to be labeled. Uh, I think uh, we need to be able to show that there are various contexts in which concepts are, are associated uh, and really allow users to, to sort of drill down based on their particular interests. Uh, Dr. Shet was making this point. You really want to segment all the drugs into whatever they are. Provide a whole bunch of different dimensions, for, well, not, not in the broader sense, for people to drill down. So I think subgraphs probably should be labeled. Now, that's a complex problem, but I think labeling is a big, big issue for me. The mesh semantic similarity really, I mean, it's subjective. If you're clustering documents based on some kind of similarity of documents, ultimately you run into a threshold issue. Uh, it's really subjective. You can set that however you choose. So along those lines, one of the things that you did when you were interpreting your graphs is you identified that certain concepts there were related. Some were proteins, some were icosinoids, right. some right. were other things. Towards labeling, do you envision that that would be something that could be automated at some point where after you've developed this, this multi-graph that you can say, okay, these things actually can merge, yeah. and then that will lend itself to a, a simpler label? Automatically, right. Uh, that, that might be the way to go with that. What I'm thinking for labeling for now, well, you have to label on, on three different uh, levels, I guess. Label in terms of the mesh descriptors, label in terms of the semantic types, and perhaps label on semantic groups, which might not be all that interesting. But you know, certainly in terms of labeling uh, by semantic types, yeah, I mean, you want to collapse things together automatically, and then that might help with the overall labeling process. Yeah. More questions? Uh, could you could you speak a little bit more uh, loudly, or maybe closer to the microphone? Right. So, so can yes. you slide 34? Slide 34. Slide 34. Yes. So, uh, it's so true, right? Yeah, so, so basically, uh, when the bucket is Yes. So, you, you have, for past, you have a Can you speak closer to the microphone, please? Yes. So for the past paper, you have a threshold. Yes. And then for the bucket related, you have a different Well, I'm using the same relatedness. It's the same threshold. Oh, okay. So the both two Yes, yes. It says it's a standard deviation from the mean. It's the same thing. So the standard deviation of the uh, of the inter, uh, yes, that's correct. Okay, okay. Because I, I mean, uh, if you put it this way, for all the that you are computing the infrastructure to write the operator, and then the computer will have the operator. Right, and if that if that mean is essentially above this the second or third standard deviation, then I, I merge them, yes. Okay. Uh, other questions? Okay. Uh, thanks a lot. I, I've gone well over time and you've been very patient and I appreciate it.